I'm, I'm an open book. I'm 60 years of doing what it is that I've been doing uh, and living. You know, I feel extremely fortunate that uh, I've been able to make music, have a life, uh, and a life as I would like it to be. Um, I mean, it could always be better. I could have maybe six children instead of four, or two instead of four, but whatever. Uh, I'm just glad that I've always been able to live as according mostly to my dictates. And you pay the price for it. You know, you don't just say, oh, I'm not going to do this and everything is hunky-dory. No, no, no. You pay a price for everything that you want. Some people want to be stars and travel all over the world and people bow down to them or whatever it is. That's not exactly my uh, reason for living. My reason for living is to be balanced, to be able to enjoy the things that I've always said that I would like to enjoy. I'd like to have my family and I, I love my family. I love the idea of what family constitutes and it, it's, it, it's a freedom. It's, uh, how many people can honestly say they feel free most of the time. You know, nobody gets the whole package in life. And I've done that and, and I'm doing that. So we're, you're in a part of this thing, you know? You're part of the, the whole progression. Many, many, <laughs> many will read about the creation of this album and uh, they won't be privy to the story, the backstory, the actual point of creation and all the tumultuous circumstances that surrounded it. You've probably revisited this a million times, but just for new ears, new listeners, younger listeners specifically, um, just kind of delve into that. How was it when you look back? I, when I came to England at the age of 12, myself and my brothers, uh, it was not to stay. That's the first thing. But, at 12 years old, you got no right uh, with regard to things like that. So I always knew that I want to come to England uh, because my father is there, my mother is there. And when I come to England, I was extremely advanced in uh, academia. And so therefore I felt that I could do anything and anything coalesced into becoming a doctor because at about the age of two, I had suffered from diphtheria. And if you know anything about diphtheria, it is so aggressive that only one in two children lived. I lived. The kid that was next to me died. So I appreciated that the guy who cut my throat to let me be able to breathe that he was special. And my mother and my father were always telling me about this journey, you know, that it's a surgeon that did this. That's a surgeon that did that. And I thought, well, now that I'm getting big and I understand what all the surgeons mean and all this, I, I really should go and become a surgeon and I'll be able to come back and do that thing for some other kid or whatever. And so therefore, it was never with the intent that I'm gonna stay in England, especially since I came and found it so cold. But what England had for me was an opportunity. Whether that opportunity was going to be academic or whether it's gonna be musical or cultural, whatever it is, it had an opportunity for me that wouldn't necessarily reside at home. So, Take advantage of it. Listen, man, I did not have no girlfriend and all them kind of things like everybody else. I was so fixed on what it is that I wanted to do and wanted to be. My wife tells me now that 
I must have been a bit of a snob because yeah, I was a good looking boy and all of that and got girls coming around from there. But it did not really interest me because I saw it as a time wasting thing. And so playing the guitar, playing the other instruments so, and to trying to be that as well as trying to be a sports jock and trying to be uh, a, an academic, it took up my whole life. So when the time was coming that I could now be a musician, and it became so obvious now because I've got a hit record, and I know that I'm not going to just let it go. I'm just going to do what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is to make more records and make more records, and then eventually go home, get out of the cold. You know, I mean, you see me, eh? <laughs> <laughs> this, today is not a cold day. No. I've played football without a shirt on in the snow. So I know what cold is. And I know it's like to go wash your hand under the hot water, and then you get chill blains and all of that. I know all of that. So why have I got these gloves on? Protection, but <laughs> I know what it is. They say every man must have protection. And this keeps me, I can have my chest open, I'm warm, you know? So that, going home was natural. It is natural. Didn't touch on the process of creating okay. Killer on the Rampage. And I really want people to know that story because the, there is a thing that I've got with youngsters not reading. So they can go and read it, but I want, to, I want them to hear it from your own, your own mouth. Now, that's... It's part of the whole process with, uh, with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that so that I can tell it to you honestly, I have to tell it to you in my way. Yeah? Because I've told the story so many times. Of course, happy right. to hear it, whichever way you present okay. it. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking to go back to the sun. It didn't have to be the Caribbean. I went first of all to uh, Ibiza. And there was a perfect situation for me in Ibiza. There was Terry Thomas's house, one of the, one of the legends of comedy in this country. He had a home there, it's very nice. And there was a studio there called Ibiza Sound, which I was looking to buy. And so all of that was on the, the landscape. I went to play in Ibiza and the uh, promoter ran away with the money. And I wouldn't go on stage. And so the police arrested me and they threw me in jail. And with that, I realized this can't work for me because I don't speak Spanish. It'll take me a long time. I can't take my family there and so on. So I had to look for elsewhere. Elsewhere turned out to be Barbados because Barbados had fantastic, has fantastic communications. In those days, Guyana didn't. So you'd have to go and stand in front of the cable and wireless uh, at 11 o'clock at night, because it's four o'clock in the morning in England or wherever it is. And number 10, your time, come on, you're in booth five, this sort of thing. I couldn't, it couldn't work. So it became Barbados. Having to go to Barbados, you gotta find a house. And I tried this and I tried that. And everything seemed to lead me away from the city and all of that, where other people would want to go and buy a flashy apartment or whatever it is. Now, I had to find somewhere that could constitute my studio and the kind of life that I live, which is a quiet, family-oriented life. And so, eventually, 
after a couple of disappointments, I was led to the most important piece of real estate in Barbados. I say that because Bailey's Plantation, which is where I live, is the site of the 1816 rebellion, Bustle's Rebellion, mm -hmm. uh, in that country, which freed the, the people, basically, brought freedom to the Barbadian. Not immediately, but like all the other uh, to saints, uh, re revolt in Haiti and so on. It's mm -hmm. the next one. And the situation is tied, but we don't have time for that. I now established that I have a house, but my family was in, in England. I have to try and get them there as quickly as possible. And the record companies that I licensed still giving me a problem because I think that I'm just another black Jamaican who's come and taken their advance and gone and spend it on ganja weed and whatever it is, whatever it is it was in their heads. Mm -hmm. And that was coming down to me. So eventually I had to go and get the studio ready. The studio never got ready uh, in the time that I wanted. So I had to start recording um, the album. At the same time as I'm recording the album, I promised Marcia Barrett from Boney M that I would work on her album. So Marcia came down and I'm there and the, the guys are working in the studio, banging this and banging that. And I'm having to make two albums at the same time. So I would work on Marcia's in the day and I'd work on mine in the night. So you ask me then, when did you sleep? I slept, but in fits and starts. Mm. And over a period of time, I started to get the songs together because I had no songs. Songs were lost in transit uh, with BA and all my clothes and so I was working in my shorts and these photographs you see of the tag I'm just in this pair of shorts and Killer on the Rampage is one of those photographs that you see with me and it's just a t-shirt and a pair of shorts mm -hmm. that, that was a thing. and so I'm in the environment and I'm making music non-stop and I'm writing songs non-stop Electric Avenue just happened to be one of those songs. I Don't Want to Dance just happened to be one of those songs. War Party. Possibly my, probably my most favorite song in terms of the eloquence, if you like, mm -hmm. the, the, the way that it came mm. uh, and the time at which it came, which is why it didn't go to number one or number five. It came down the charts because it got banned. Like uh, there were a couple more, Marley and mm. Bob Dylan, I think, that they banned their song, but they didn't have no singles out at the time. And so I got hurt with War Party in that manner. But it didn't matter because every time I go on stage and I play it, the crowd reacts absolutely positively. You look well. Thank you. Speak on it. Speak on what keeps you in shape physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I want my wife to write <laughs> uh, a book on, on, my, on my eating habits and exercise habits and what it is that really makes me me. Look. Would that spoil the book then? Just give us a little snippet, a little insight. <laughs> no, I, uh, I live simply. Hmm. Uh, I have a lot of stress because the music business is, uh, is full of stress. But in as much as I have that stress, I have the means to, to fight it. 
I have, as you probably know, from very young, uh, I had heart issues. And by the time I reached 23, it had reached its, what I thought was its maximum. And if you really think you're gonna die. And so you are on a different time scale to everybody else, because everybody else thinks that they're gonna live. Everybody else thinks that they're gonna see tomorrow. But no, I didn't, I, I chose not to live that way and to take absolute good care. I mean, not that I ever had any other kind of care for myself, but I started to become even more stringent and more careful to prolong this life. Mm. And I don't think that I've done badly because I have had real serious issues with this life. But if you, it's like a car. The difference between my car and your car, you would be amazed. I drive a 40 year old car. And if you see it, it looks brand spanking new. I mean, I use it not as much maybe as you, but the fact of the matter is, even if you put it down and you don't care it, it will fall apart on you. So it's the same with the life. Most people look after their cars better than they look after themselves. And that's not me. So I eat simply, I eat uh, a little, uh, breakfast in the morning, and I eat, next time I'll eat probably is six o'clock in the, the night. And that's it. And I don't eat a lot. And I exercise whenever I'm well. I exercise. I don't over-exercise. I have a, a guru who is a fitness fanatic. His name is Earl Maynard. You may not know that name, mm. but Earl Maynard was the first, possibly the first superstar out of the Caribbean. Uh, he was Mr. Universe twice. Oh, it's funny. I do know that name, actually. Yes. Yeah. And he basically looks after my exercise regime. Mm. And so whenever it is that I'm going to come out to play, I have an intense uh, workout schedule with Earl. And so then my body looks good. <laughs> you know, I don't have to apologize for that. I don't want to dance. I just wanted yes. to know that particular track, you know, what would you say? It seems obvious, but I want people to kind of hear it from. The obvious is not necessarily the obvious. If you understand my background, the first interface with music would have been Calypso. Calypso has a certain way of dealing with issues that you're speaking and yet you're not speaking what you're saying. Uh, and I learned that very young. I learned how to, what they call him, rap now. I, I learned that back there at the age of five, you know, by listening to the guys who are the master rappers, uh, the kind of songs. They can say anything, anyhow, and make you entertain and keep you laughing. And I learned that. So I include that in everything that I do. I mean, it's, it's as I say, if I play two notes in a song, one's got to be Calypso. So the, the way in which I Don't Want to Dance came, and the fact that it was the first song that uh, came out of me in this new environment, in this new career, because now I was getting hits and left, right, and center. Uh, and so I, I went back into me. Uh, I Don't Want to Dance talks about a love affair, basically, that 
between a man or a woman or a man and a man, whoever it is that you're dealing with, because the, today is a different world. It's not that today is that much different to how it was. It's always been the same world, but you know, you, you twist it and you turn it and you put some eggs with it and beat it and you've got yourself a, <laughs> a new omelet. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's that's what happened. I, I, I'm dealing with what is normal for people. Uh, you've got a love affair or you've got some kind of affair with some person or whatever and they're trying to make you into something that you don't want that to happen and so your imagination will tell you so therefore I do something else but the way in which the video would portray it and or, or the the guys at the radio station would hear it and and all people because that's what I intend is because if I start saying the things like living on the front line I mean I am now living on the front line got through the, the reality is that it, because it is so bold and so straightforward and whatever that not in that time. <laughs> it don't happen. It, it don't happen now, mm. you know. Or else I'll get a hundred hit records. Mm. So this particular song, it points away, and it was the first song on the album, first song written for the album, and it expressed kind of a deep feeling between myself and this person or this thing or this country that I love and that it let me down. <laughs> you know, I wanted to hear you, uh, you break it down because like I said, it seems obvious uh, and it wasn't. So Yeah, well that's, that's the, the, the whole doctrine, Calypso doctrine is that you, you're seeing shadows, you know. And I, I don't like to spend time talking about the song because it's personal to you. Mm. Uh, what you draw out of it, it makes you happy, you know. I can come and explain something and it totally destroy what you were thinking and how you were feeling. And so I don't interfere with that normally. It'd be good to get your perspective on music in 2024, the business, the industry, just perspective. We don't have to delve too deep, but just the differences, I guess, stark differences from when you were coming up and, and I guess the advantages that you may see that I have. What disadvantages? Music has become another commodity. Was it always another commodity? I don't think so. I think it was a commodity nevertheless because it was run by big industry corporate regardless of when it was a hundred years ago what it's always been corporate and the artist has always been the last consideration um, by the time I would have come around, which was mid-60s, it was starting to become a grown-up business. By 1969, music had become seriously corporate. So that tells you how far back mm. the, the, the stuff goes. And when you come and you find a situation you just have to deal with it. I dealt with it uh, by gaining knowledge. You don't gain knowledge very easily in this world. You have to pay for it. Uh, and in as much as that, uh, that is the situation, so I paid for it and tried to gain respect from those for whom I worked. 
because everybody's working for somebody. And the last you come to realize is the public. The public expects this from you, but you are having expectations from somebody else. And so you are just another worker. And I, 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 I say this to people all the time, that whatever it is that you become in the music business, you have to work for it. If you don't work for it, it doesn't happen for you. It, you may think that it's happening for you, but then you get caught up in drugs and you get caught up in hustling and, and all kinds of things happen to you. And you say to yourself, how did I get here? Just, I only wanted to play music. Well, I never went there. I just stayed playing music. And in some ways, uh, visualizing my position that I wanted to be in. Mm. And I've gone into that position. The, the respect that I enjoy in this music business is hard worked for. Hard, extremely hardly worked for, you know? So when I look at what's happening today now, you've got today uh, plenty media, enough, enough media, media to kill you. I mean, everybody's a podcaster, everybody's a broadcaster, everybody's telling lies, everybody is, you know, playing games with the technology that is a beautiful technology. I prayed for it for maybe 30 years. And now that it's come, it's maybe even above my estimation of where it could go and, and, and what it can do. Is it doing that? Only to some degree. Right. Uh, it's being malused. People have become slaves to it. Maybe people have always been slaves to the media, but it's a different kind of more insidious, more aggressive, more unkind use of the media. And it's a beautiful, beautiful media, you know? Uh, you, you've got access to the world if the world wants you, you know? Uh, so that's how I see the whole thing. I mean, I can't talk about any one artist or so on because we're all subject to the same rules, regulations, and whatever it is. The way in which we are treated, well, I can expand on that for the next hundred years, but really and truthfully, we've got the tools that we can do the job. And in most cases today, we are not choosing to do the job that the tools require. I knew I had to get your perspective, so thanks for sharing. Yes. I really, really appreciate it. Um, musically, beyond your own creations, what are you, what are you listening to? I listen to everything that passes my ear. I don't go and sit down and say, I, I want to hear this or want to. Very rarely, very, very rarely. I, I mean, and sometimes it's good to go back and see what you've missed that was back there. And there's a lot back there that maybe that didn't have time to, or whatever it is. Um, In such situations, you always tend to do somebody harm. So what I can say is that the music has met its time, has met its audience, audiences, has met its opportunities, and it's there for everybody who wants to make music and or films and or because they're both interchangeable 
And so that really is, is my take on where music is at right now. Nothing's new huh. under the sun. Nothing's new. It's just in a whole different configuration of what was. One of the things I'm picking up on in this conversation is that you have had your battles. Oh. Big, 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 oh, peak, big, big peaks, big troughs yeah. and everything in the middle. Um, but your power of manifestation and visualization, it seems to be potent. Speak well, on that. And have you, have you tapped into, you've already told me you have, but just speak on tapping into and understanding that you have that ability have had that ability, continue to. Um, because I don't think it's a sense of awareness that a lot of people walk with. Life is a battle. And certainly my life has been a battle from day one. Basically, health through uh, genetics, because you don't come with anything else but genetics. You don't have opportunity from the womb. If, if you have, it is genetically modified. Really <laughs> yes. yes. So from the day one, you're struggling for air. You're gasping for air and reaching your hand to get above the water and to feel the air and to, and to use whatever it is that your hand touches to pull you to shore. That's uh, an analogy that uh, I can throw out there. Now, if, if, if you get something to grab hold of, it's incumbent on you to make the best use of it. You're not the, the director of this movie, the, the director of the movie is God, if you like, or whatever faith you develop. Uh, and so in my case, I threw away the church at a very young age because I recognize the church is not God. And since I'm not going to see God, I have to behave like how I think it's right. And whatever it is that moves me through this magnificent edifice that we call the world, it's going to look after me. It's going to, it's going to put me in the right grooves, the right thing. I don't have to worry about God. I don't have to, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do any of these things because I have been made to, to be, and it, again, this could go on for a long while, but simply put, is that I believe that whatever it is that is for a person, they don't have to run to it. It comes to them. That's after all these years, I've come to realize it don't mean that you sit on your ass and you do nothing, but you do what you feel like doing. And as you're going, it's like being on the train. You don't even know when you're on the other line and you're going in a totally different direction. So I enjoy that. I enjoy that aspect of life. I totally enjoy, you know. What's the one question that you've never been asked that you wish you had? No. I make music. I don't make music like other people make music. I know that because I know how to make music like other people make music. What I wish is for people to interface who like my music because that's, it's for them that I'm making it. 
for them to interface with all or as much as all that I've made. And that would make me the happiest person under the sun because they'd have a journey that they could never have imagined. That's the only way I can answer that question.